Good evening. How are you this week? I fell sick. You've been sick? Which is, yeah. Well, look, good luck on me. Just not feeling great. Yeah. Yeah, it's fucking tough. It's the back to school blues. Welcome back to germs. Maybe. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be worse this year because, especially if you were home all last year, you didn't get exposed to germs. So you're every, everyone's immune system has to get kicked back in so i expect a lot of sniffles and sneezes and yeah. right here. all right let me make sure we're recording and then we'll get started yep okay all right so steven's not going to be with us tonight again so we're, going, we're ready to get going did you two have a chance to watch the video? I know, I know let's see, I forgot who, <laughs> I can't even remember. Who was here last Thursday with Intermicron Forces? I can't remember. It was, Jeffrey, was it you who was here for the, last Thursday? Anyway, so have, have you guys had a chance? To, you were here? Okay. So... <laughs> So, Jeffrey, did you have a chance to watch the video I posted? Strong answer. Good answer. All right. So I'm assuming then that both of you have, you know, have, have witnessed that, watched the video, whatever, and at least have a beginning understanding of the intermolecular forces. What I wanted to do tonight with the first half of our class is walk through these, honestly, these are, these are AP questions. And just talk about how intermolecular forces affect physical properties. So this one got cut off. I don't even know what happened to that. So we'll just skip that one. So let's start here. And I'm just gonna talk through it and see if it makes sense if you, as you listen. So the normal boiling point of carbon tetrachloride is 77 degrees Celsius, whereas that of carbon tetrabromide, a very similar compound, is 190 degrees Celsius. And so we just want to explain why that is. One of the most basic things to even consider right now is what are the major implications? Like, what is the grand stroke main idea of why this compound would have a higher boiling point? And this one, remember boiling point means to go from the liquid state to the gas state. If this one has a higher boiling point, that simply is implying that it's harder to boil. It's going to be harder to go from liquid to gas. So that's the bottom line. Now we, get, we can ask the question, well, why would that be? All physical properties of these covalent molecular compounds arise from their intermolecular forces. So then what we know immediately is that CCBR, because it's harder, has more intermolecular forces that we learned about last week. It has more. So we've hit the main idea. We basically answered the question but what we would want to do now is go in and say, okay, well, specifically, what does it have? Why does it have more? To answer that question, we look at the uh, polarity. So we go through that whole rigmarole of Lewis structure. All right, and they're both going to have a very similar Lewis structure. Very, very similar molecules. So 
So we're going to run out of room here. So let's just kind of orally go through what we're looking at. This molecule here has one, two, three, four domains. So it's going to be tetrahedral. All four are bonding. So it's tetrahedral molecular geometry. And as we learned, that gives us that shape right there. That is tetrahedral. And it is symmetric. Bottom line, this molecule right here is nonpolar. Nonpolar. And this molecule looks exactly the same. Tetrahedral, all of the same. So this one's nonpolar. <clears throat> Both are nonpolar. Now, from last week, the last week's discussion is if you're nonpolar, we've learned that. So only London dispersion forces exist. Neither of these have dipole dipole dipoles. There's no hydrogen bonding, only dispersion forces. So why then, how does CBr4 have more? They both have only London dispersion, but CBr has more. And that's because CBr4 is more polarizable. What that means, if you remember, is that London dispersion forces are created when the molecule gets kind of shifted or disturbed, distorted. It forms instantaneous dipoles that just weakly attract and then bounce back to their normal shape. They don't last very long. But it's easier to mess up CBR4 because it is larger, more electron cloud. And that is why CBR4 has a higher boiling point than CCL4. All right, in the next question, we have, you know, it's all similar, but this time we're asking about state of matter. At ordinary conditions, HF is a liquid, whereas HCl is a gas. Okay, they gave us the boiling point. We don't really care, liquid or gas. Why? So remember the states of matter are all for these molecules, these are covalent molecular. The state of matter for all of these depends on IMF. So if HF has stronger IMS. And that's a statement of fact because we know it's a liquid. Liquids have more attractions. The particles come together to liquefy. If they weren't attracted, they would just stay gases. So solids have the most attractions, then liquids, then gases. So HF must have stronger IMS. So let's investigate why. Here's HF, here's HCl. Both are very simple molecules to, to sketch for Lewis structures. Let's go through the geometry. They both have the same geometry. So let's just talk through one. I see linear, okay, only two atoms. So we really don't need to worry about geometry. It's more of a delta EN problem. If you remember your electronegativities, fluorine is four, hydrogen is 2.1, chlorine is three. So for this one, it's four minus 2.1, which is, a uh, let's see, 1.9. And this one is 3.0 for chlorine minus 2.1. So that one's only 0.9, but that's okay. Bottom line is both are polar molecules. Why do we care about that? Because if you're polar, 
both have London dispersion forces, just like these, and dipole dipole. Because you're polar, you get to have dipole dipole. If we take a closer look, though, we know that HF has to have stronger, and we can see why if we take that closer look, HF can hydrogen bond, HCl cannot. So, but HF can have stronger or just strong hydrogen bonds that are stronger. So just because HF can get to have those hydrogen bonds, that affects its, states of, its state of matter. The particles are more sticky to each other, and it will liquefy. That's your, that's your result. So some of these are, are pretty repetitive. Uh, and number four here, we have two molecules, both are diatomic. So, you know, I is a solid. Well, we know what that means. If you're a solid, that means iodine has more IMFs. And if we start looking at what they have, both of these are exactly the same, extremely symmetric. The delta N, EN for both of those equals zero. Both of these are nonpolar. So if they're nonpolar, that means they only have the London dispersion forces we talked about in problem two. And it's the exact same reason. I2 is more polarizable, there's that word again, because it is larger. And that means it has more electrons to distort. And that's it, stronger IMS. So it'll be a solid. It's that much different. Fluorine is a halogen. It's a gas. Iodine is a halogen. And it's normally a solid. Let me remind myself what's on the back here. <laughs> Yeah, let's do some on the back here. A little bit, little bit different properties to address. <clears throat> you guys have any questions on the ones we've done so far? All right. So in number seven, ammonia is very soluble in water, but this molecule phosphine is moderately. The, the uh, property that we're looking at here is solubility in water. So to answer this, we kind of have to know a little bit about the solubility of water. Maybe you know this, maybe you don't. But water is polar. We did the Lewis structure of this. I hope you learned a little bit about this in biology, middle school. It is bent geometry, so it is polar. Therefore, if ammonia is soluble in water, it must be polar also, okay? If phosphine is moderately soluble, well, it must be polar also, but something else must be going on if ammonia is very soluble. So let's see what, what's going on. From the Lewis structure, this is ammonia. And this is phosphine. Yeah, very similar molecules. So they're going to have the same geometry. Let's walk through it. I see one, two, three, four domains. So this is tetrahedral. Three of those four are bonding. So this will be trigonal, pyramidal. Again, this one has the same, the same of both. But we need to look at the symmetry. Does trigonal pyramidal have symmetry? And the answer is no. So both are polar. Well, we knew that. They're soluble in water. They're polar. And now we see why. So both have London dispersion forces that are pretty weak. 
and dipole dipole. But once again, if we look closer, ammonia can hydrogen bond. It's got the HN connection. Phosphorus cannot. Remember, hydrogen bonds have to be hydrogen bonded directly to F, O, or N. And we don't, we don't have that. But ammonia can hydrogen bond not just with itself, but with water. Because we have hydrogen bonding here as well. That's why it's more soluble. They both are soluble, but ammonia is more. All right, let's skip number eight. It's just more of kind of the same. And let's take a look at number nine. Let's read the statement in the box and then you can decide if you agree or disagree with that statement. When water boils, H2O molecules break apart to form hydrogen molecules and oxygen molecules. So we know what water looks like geometrically, but this is saying that when water boils, H2O breaks up to form hydrogen plus oxygen. Do you guys agree with that or disagree with that? No bravery, huh? Well, I hope you disagree. What's being illustrated here is a chemical change. Whereas boiling, boiling goes from liquid to gas. That's a phase change. And phase changes are physical, all of them, physical changes, stuff you learned in middle school. For polar, co or sorry, for any covalent molecular molecule, physical changes are due to IMFs, those intermolecular forces. Boiling water overcomes, you take a look at the structure, water's polar, so it overcomes specifically LDFs, dipole, dipole, and most importantly, for water anyway, for hy is hydrogen bonding. So boiling has nothing to do with breaking the molecule into pieces. All right, any questions on that? It's a little bit of a higher level for, for first year chemistry, but it's good to be exposed to it early. All right, well, if there are no other questions, we're gonna get back to our gases. And I believe I accidentally recycled our guesses. Hang on, let's go and find it. That's what I get for cleaning up. There's our notes, kept those. I 
I think I recycled it. I got to print it again. All right, well, while I'm hitting print, you may want to have your um, notes from last time of the gas laws. We're going to apply those now, which means we're just going to do some pre-algebra, essentially. These type of problems are a staple of first year chemistry. You're going to do them in your class. If you were to take a CBE or something, you're guaranteed to do these problems. Prototypical first year chemistry stuff here, nothing advanced whatsoever. All right, I want to keep this handy to refer to it. Uh oh, what's my computer telling me now? All right. <clears throat> So last week, we, uh, we went through all the different um, relationships. We know that when we deal with gases, pressure, volume, temperature, and moles are the four properties that we basically need that can tell us about how gases are behaving. And we broke them down two at a time, and we got a bunch of relationships. The PV relationship is inverse. That's Boyle's law. And if we're dealing with those two, this is the equation we'll use. It looks unique. It's the only one that looks that way. Whereas all the other ones, are direct proportions. Charles's volume and temperature, Gabe Lussac is pressure and temperature, Avogadro is volume and moles, and Dalton is volume and moles for now too. We won't have any combined just yet. Before we do any of these word problems, a reminder, when we work with gases, the temperatures that we have to work with must be in Kelvin. We can, we can only do work in absolute temperatures, which is Kelvin. Looking at problem number one here, it says a container of oxygen has a volume. So this is a V. And it says it's at a temperature of 21 Celsius. So that's T. And it looks like from the context clues here, these two terms go together. So I'm just going to say that's V1 and T1. Just as long as they're together, it doesn't matter what your subscript is. What volume will the gas occupy? Well, that's my question. I'm going to call that V2 at 51 degrees Celsius. I'm going to call that my T2. Now, what do I have? I have volume. I have temperature. So my knowledge of the relationships is that volume and temperature are directly proportional. That's Charles's law. And I know exactly how that sets up. That's V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. My missing piece of information is V2. There it is. I'm going to plug in these three, use some pre-algebra, and solve that. Before I plug in, though, I do notice my temperatures in, in Celsius. So we're going to add 273 to get to Kelvin. Remember, Celsius plus 273 equals Kelvin. I believe that's 294 Kelvin. And this one, 51 plus 273, 324 Kelvin. All right, we're good to go. You can plug in first, or you can rearrange your variables first. I happen to like getting students to do that first. So if I bring T2 over, I'll get V1 T2 over T1 to equal V2. Now all I do is sub in and simplify. There'll be no more moving variables around. So let's do that. V2 will be Where's my V1? There it is. 345 milliliters. T2 is 324 Kelvin. And V1 is 294 Kelvin. Let's simplify that. Q 
Okay. I see three sig figs, so that'll be 380 milliliters. Hopefully you don't find that too complicated. We read a problem, we have to tell what we're being given in terms of the properties of gases. And then based on that, we have to make a choice about which gas law, which relationship we're using to solve it. And then it's just a proportion. And we're gonna plug in and use some pre-algebra to get our answer. Let's continue on with a bunch of, of the different examples here. A sample of nitrogen in the lab occupies 720 mils. All right, so that's a volume at 0.98 atmospheres. All right, so there's no words there. Uh, so this says volume, but it doesn't say what this is. Last week, I introduced you to some pressure units. That is a pressure. And it looks like those two go together. So let's call it V1 and P1. What volume will the gas occupy? So there's my question. Again, it's going to be a V2 at a pressure of 1.39. And of course, assume the temperature is constant. That's, we have to assume that to make this work. So we learned last week that P is inversely proportional to V. And that is Boyle's law, P1V1 equals P2V2. We're solving for V2. Before we sub in, let's just do some algebra here to get uh, V2 by itself. Oops, uh, P2. All right, so V2 is just gonna be P1, which is 0.98 atmospheres times V1, 720 mils all over P2, 1.39 atmospheres. And we simplify. All right, rounded two sig figs, 510 milliliters. And just see if it makes sense. The pressure is going up, okay? So we're squeezing it. When you squeeze something, does the volume go down or up? My common sense should tell you it goes down. You squeeze something, it gets smaller. And that's what we're seeing. That's inverse proportionals. Pressure up, volume down. All right, our third problem looks like it's dealing with pressure and temperature again, but it is in Celsius. So we're gonna add 273 to that. It gives me 300 Kelvin. And then the, we're given a, another pressure. So that's gonna be my P2 at what temperature? So for this problem, we're looking for temperature two in Celsius. So watch what has to happen here. The variables or the properties that we're looking at for this problem is pressure and temperature. We learned last week, they are directly proportional. It's gonna look just like the Charles law. P1 over T1 instead of V1. P1 over T1 equals P2 over T2. Note the similarities with Charles's law, direct proportion. All right, so let's rearrange it and solve for T2. Now the algebra is a little bit more tricky here because the one we're looking for is in the bottom. So I'm gonna do something kooky. I'm actually gonna flip the whole thing upside down first. Yep, we can do that in algebra. We just divide everything by negative one, or take everything to the negative one power. All right, I flip the whole thing upside down. The proportion still holds. I haven't violated anything. These are just proportions. Now, T2 is in the top, and it's a lot easier 
to uh, modify. So multiply both sides by P2, we get P2 T1 over P1 equals T2. All right, that's what we need. So we'll sub in, P2 is 6.45 atmospheres. My T1 is that 300 Kelvin we calculated. And P1 is, where is it, 4.5. So let's think about it. What's going to happen here? Pressure is going up. So again, I'm squeezing something. And temperature may not be quite as intuitive to you. But when you squeeze anything, including a gas, the particles start coming closer together. So you are increasing the energy of the system. So it is going to, let's see, is that the best way to describe it? You're squeezing it. So yeah, you're increasing the energy system. So the temperature goes up. I guess that is about the easiest way to describe it. So it makes sense. Pressure goes up, temperature should go up. All right, so we get 430. You need to be careful here. That's Kelvin. And don't walk away from this problem because it says at what temperature in Celsius will it reach a pressure of 6.45 atmospheres? So we're not there yet. We need to subtract 170, or sorry, 273 from that and get 157 degrees Celsius. That's our T2. And that's still higher than the original temperature. So we, we haven't violated anything. It's still getting hotter internally by doing that. All right, let's go to number 11. I was looking for different variations of the problems and I don't, they're all the same until we get over here. So a 13.5 liter sample of gas has 0.145 moles. Okay, so this is new. This is gonna be moles in proportion to something. So this is N and this is V over here. Volume is determined to contain, so these two go together. At the same temperature and pressure, how many moles of gas, okay, so N2 is my question, will there be in a 28 liters? All right, so that's my V2. So it looks like this problem is saying, okay, if I take a volume and I, and I expand it, okay, like a balloon, if I want to make a balloon get bigger, what do I need to do the number of moles inside the balloon? I hope that's obvious. It should be, you got to blow some air into it if you want to make a balloon bigger. So we expect this to go up. The relationship between N and V is a direct one, just like we've been working with. So N1 over V1 equals N2 over V2. Again, all of these direct proportions, I can turn, I can flip upside down. It doesn't matter what goes on top. The only thing that matters is one over one, two's over two. You can do N over V or V over N as long as they're both the same way. We're looking for N2, so I need to multiply both sides by V2. So we get V2 N1 over V1. All right, we'll plug in and see what happens. V2 is 28 liters. N1 is 0.145. Remember, we're expecting our answer to go up. I'm expecting it to about double because V1 is 13.5. That's just a little bit more than double the volume. So I would expect the moles to do so as well. So point, oh, sorry, 28. 
That is a two. 28 times 0.145 divided by 13.5. And we will round that to 0.3. And there we go. It did just slightly more than double by blowing more air into it. Or it doubled because we blew twice as much air into it. Okay, so the rest of the problems in this little worksheet here are the same. It's just you need to practice reading and figuring out which, which gas law to apply. So this is gonna be the weekend's homework if you haven't finished or are still working on the other big one that's due today. So we'll say four through 10 is due Tuesday and we'll check it, check our answers on Tuesday. All right, this next one is combined gas law. I'm only gonna print the first page. I don't have any intention of doing all of them. But in this particular uh, attachment, the key is on the last page. So you can always check your work easily on that one. Let's print that up. Okay, so let's remind ourselves what the combined gas law is. We talked about this on, on Tuesday. A combined gas law comes about because we take out of our four variables, our four properties, we take three of them. We take the pressure, the volume, and the temperature. And the only thing we're holding constant is the number of moles. When we do that, we are actually going to physically combine the Boyle's law, the Charles law, and the Gay-Lussac law. And this is the equation we get. You can see it's a combination boils on his, if you look at it this way here, boils. And if you cover up the V's, there's Gay-Lussac's law. If you cover up the P's, you get Charles's law. So that's why they call it the combined gas law. Other than that, it doesn't really take much uh, extra effort on our part. Some teachers actually only use the combined gas law and they say, well, if you're doing the other problems, like on the other worksheet we just worked on and like, and you, for example, have no information about pressure changing, you just mark it out of the equation. So the combined gas law will simplify to all of the other ones. Also, the rule we had about temperature having to be in Kelvin absolutely applies. Any gas law problem you ever work, you better be in Kelvin. So let's do a few combined gas law problems for thoroughness here. If I initially have a gas at a pressure of 12 atmospheres, so this is my P, a volume of 23 liters, there's my V, and a temperature, so there's my T, and they go together. So this is P1, V1, T1. And then I raise the pressure, all right, so that's my P2, and increase the temperature, okay, what is the new volume? So I'm looking for V2. Before I jump into the fire, I do recognize my temperatures are in Kelvin. I'm good to go, no conversions necessary. So the combined gas law is P1V1 over T1 equals P2V2 over T2. We're looking for V2. So let's get V2 by itself. So I'm going to take P that way and T that way. So that P2 will equal P1 V1 T2 over T1 
P2. That was supposed to be a V2. So we're looking for a V2. This is fine. I did that right. That's a V2. All right. So we get 12 atmospheres, 23 liters, and 300 Kelvin. That's why it's, you know, I'm not going to use the word important, but I think it's very helpful that when you read these word problems, you do some labeling. Because if you can have some faith in your labeling, you know, the first time you go through it, then when you start substitution here, it's a lot less stressful. Your T1 is 200 Kelvin. And P2 is 14. And that's it. We just need to simplify now and we'll get a V2. 12 times 23 times 300 divided by 200 times 14. So V goes up. Let's see how many sig figs. Looks like two. So it'll be 29.57 will round up to 30, 30 liters. I'm just trying to decide how many of these to work. I mean, on one hand, they're pretty easy, but I don't want to go through them too quickly either. So number two is not that much different. We got a volume, a pressure, a temperature. If I raise the temperature, so that's going to be my T2. Lower the pressure, P2. What is the new volume? Well, that one's exactly the same thing. So therefore I'm not even gonna work it because it's exactly the same math. Let's move on. Number three, a gas has a volume of 28 liters. Okay, so that's a V, a temperature of 45. All right, that's a T, it's in Celsius. We'll come back and do that. And an unknown pressure. All right, so my P1 is, is unknown. The volume is increased to 34, all right? So that's my V2. Its temperature is decreased to 35. If I measure the pressure after the change, so that kind of even just tells you it's P2. What was the original pressure? All right, let's take care of those temperatures. So remember Celsius plus 273 gives us Kelvin. So it'll be 318 Kelvin. 35 plus 273 gives me 308 Kelvin. All right. So again, the ideal, sorry, the combined gas law, P1, V1 over T1 equals P2, V2 over T2. This time we are looking for P2. So I'm going to take T2 that way. I'm going to take V2 that way. P2 will equal P1, V1, T2. That didn't change. Over T1, V2. I must be getting tired. Must be getting tired. All right, so we're looking for P1 on this one, not P2. So I need to take T1 that way and V1 that way. So P1 equals P2. 
P2V2 T1 over T2V1. Now I got it. All right. So two atmospheres, V2, let's find it, I lost it. There it is, 34 liters. And T1, not T2, T1 is 318 Kelvin. All right, T2 is 308. And V1 is 28. Whew. All right, let's see what we got here. Two times 34 times 318. All right, that's a pretty big number. And then divided by 308. And then we divide one more time by 28. So it comes out to be 2.5 atmospheres. After all that, it went up just a little. Just a little. All right, I hope you're feeling pretty confident in this combined gas law. It's not not really that hard. So let me give you a moment here to read number four, set it up, and see if you can solve that one without me. It wants the new volume. I'm going to take it off screen and do the work while you're working. All right, here's what I hope you got. First of all, I hope you remember to go to Kelvin. And another thing I want to point out here, this is our combined gas law. If you read the problem, it says the pressure is not changed. What that means is P1 equals P2. And so you can see, I just marked them out. In this problem, the combined gas law actually simplified down to Charles's law. So really, this was, this was just a Charles's law problem. And that's what the work you see here. V2, I rearranged my variables. V2, 
equals this expression. I plugged in so, and solved 4.7 liters. If I allow a balloon or a tire to heat up, the temperature goes up, that gas is going to expand. That's our, that's our experience in nature. Warm gases expand. And so we have a volume that did go up as well. It didn't go up a lot. It only went up 0.2 liters. And you're thinking, well, that's not very much. Well, neither is this temperature change. You know, that's not, that's not a huge change in temperature. 14 to 29 Celsius, that's not going to blow anybody's socks off. All right, let's uh, let's take a let's take a three minute restroom break. I've been in here since six. I know you guys are probably need one. Let's meet back in here at seven fifty five, and we'll pick up with the uh, ideal gas law. So three minute railroad break. Thank you. Uh, basically, we just dashed the pool. Like, say that again. Three hours. I've been sitting here. For like two hours already you have yeah yeah it's it's been a while for me too so let's take this three minutes and come back and do the last stretch Oh, I lost track of time. All right. So let's put uh, the combined gas law away. Um, as far as the homework goes, 
I'm not going to, you know, say you need to work the rest of these, but if you do look, there are uh, one, two, three, five more problems in the keys on the back. So if you want to just try one or two, three of them, just to see if you've got it, you can do your work and the key, like I said, is right there. So with that being said, I'm not going to make an extra assignment for that. So all of this is leading up to the ideal gas law. Let's see how many pages of this, I don't want all of it. Let's just print the first couple. Uh, let's see, front, back, shirt, why not? All right, what is this ideal gas law that I speak of? Well, really, it's the, it's the penultimate thing here. This is what we've been shooting for since we started talking about gases. What is an ideal gas? Well, an ideal gas is a gas that behaves according to the rules set forth in this kinetic molecular theory that we talked about on Tuesday night. It's a gas whose particles are always moving in those random constant motions. It's a gas whose particles are far apart and they don't have any IMFs. It's a gas whose particles are still tiny, so their volume is negligible compared to the container. It's a gas whose particles, when they collide with each other or the walls of the container, they're elastic, they don't lose energy. And then the kinetic energy of those gases is proportional to what we call the temperature, what we define as the temperature. So that's what it means to be an ideal gas. In reality, ideal gases are very hard to make. They're actually impossible. There is no such thing as a 100% ideal gas. But we do have a few gases in nature that come pretty close. Hydrogen comes pretty close because it's really tiny. Its IMLs are pretty small. Uh, helium is very good. As a noble gas, it has very few IMFs, and it's also really, really tiny. So those two are the best ideal gases. I'll come back to that. So on this, the ideal gas law now, we're taking all four variables, P, V, N, and T. So nothing is constant. And the ideal gas law really starts moving us toward thermodynamics, which is out beyond the scope of this course. But if we group these two, we get PV, which is a work term, an energy term in physics. And NT is a statistical term uh, in physics that kind of has to do with, uh, we'll just say motion. I'll just keep it simple, okay? So as we look at the relationship, what we're really doing here is we're saying that this PV term, this work energy term, is proportional to this NT terms, which has to do with the motions of the, of the bodies here. And if we graph that, we get PV and NT are directly proportional. So another Y equals MX. Our Y and our X variables this time are kind of combos but the slope here is something very important. That is an R. It's a terrible R, but it is an R. So the equation, once we put it into Y equals MX plus B form, is Y, there's my Y variable, equals M, which is R, X, which is NT. And we rewrite that as piv nert. And there's no reason to do that other than it rolls off the tongue easier. People call this equation the piv nert equation, which I guess is better than the piv runt. PC, what, what do I know? So anyway, this is the piv nert equation and it's, uh, it's a, a very useful equation. If we know any three of the, of the, um, the properties, we could find the fourth one, so the missing one. And we use this in the real world quite often as a way for us to calculate moles. 
you know, if, if we're dealing with solids and liquids, finding moles isn't so hard. We can always just get the mass of that solid or liquid and then convert it to moles if we know what it is. But for gases, it's kind of hard. It's, it's hard to get the mass of a gas because they won't be still and sit on our triple beam balance. So instead, we can, we can get the pressure of the gas by putting it into a container. And we can find the volume of the gas or the volume of that, the same container, actually. And then we can measure the temperature of that container with a thermometer. And we can very easily uh, find a number of moles. <clears throat> So combining Boyle's, Charles, and the Avogadro's laws, you get that V is proportional to NT over P. So that's just another way of looking at what I just showed you. The proportionality constant R is called the universal gas constant. And PV equals NRT. Now, what are the values of this R? Well, there's a myriad number, uh, a lot, a plethora. So the most common one is 0 0.082 if your units are in liters, atmospheres, moles, and Kelvin. If you change any one of those four, the number value of R will change. The quantity won't, but the number expression of that will. Now, so an ideal gas obeys those kinetic theory rules, and, and that's good. But we can even work with conditions to make gases, be, like I said, helium and hydrogen are really good ideal gases. But even so, I can make hydrogen and helium even better ideal gases if I play with their conditions a little bit, okay? So at standard temperature and pressure, which is, which is just normal, uh, standard pressure is one atmosphere, so that's atmospheric pressure. And standard temperature for gases has been set at zero degrees Celsius. That's pretty cold. That's 273 Kelvin. So that's not room temperature. That's, that's the freezing point. Okay? That's 32 Fahrenheit. That's cold. But that's what they call standard temperature for gases. At standard temperature and pressure, the volume of any gas that's, is going to be of one mole of any gas is 22.4 liters. Now, what about these conditions? How can I make how can I make the conditions for an ideal gas better? Well, there's two things I can do. Number one, I can have a high temperature. The higher the temperature, the faster the, the particles of a gas are zipping around. Just zip, 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 zip. And the more the gas particles move, the more they can overcome any IMFs that are there. It's impossible to totally get rid of IMFs. But as the particles move faster and faster, the effect of the IMF goes almost to zero. So high temperature is good for gases. Low temperature is bad. In fact, if you get the temperature low enough for a gas, it will cease to be a gas and it will eventually turn into a liquid. So then the other condition is low pressure. We want to keep pressure down. If you squeeze a gas, increase the pressure, you're causing the particles to be close together. They don't want to be close together because if they are close together, they don't get to move around a lot before they bump into something. And as they bump into things, their IMFs now have a chance to reach out and grab a hold. So for gases, you want the pressure to be low. You want there to be a lot of space between them. So those are the two conditions that we can manipulate to make any gas behave more ideally. If I take helium and put it at 500 degrees Kelvin, 
and near a vacuum, it is so almost perfectly ideal. It's, it's incredible. But if I take water vapor and I cool it and squeeze it, it won't be a, it won't be a gas very long. It'll be a liquid in just a matter of moments. The ideal gas law also would set up as a proportion. Uh, we very rarely use it that way, but the constant here is the is R. So what it would look like is PV over NT. So that's Boyles, Charles, Gay-Lussac, and Avogadro's laws. P1, V1, N1, T1 equals P2, V2, N2, T2. So that technically is, is ideal gas law as well, but you by far do more pivot problems than anything else. What a long night. This, this hour and a half has been one of the slower ones, it seems like. It seems like I always run out of time. Now I'm just looking at the clock, wishing we could run out of time. <laughs> Don't tell Miss Jenny I said that. All right, so ideal gas law, P is pressure, we know this. V is volume, we know this. This is the gas constant. Moles and temp, and the temp does have to be in Kelvin, just like before. So let's do some pivot problems. What pressure is required to uh, contain 0 0.023 moles of nitrogen gas? So here's our N. Pressure is our question. 4.2 liter containers, that's our V. And here's our T, and our T is in Celsius. Let's just let's just be done with that. Two ninety three Kelvin. Add two seventy three. Get to Kelvin. All right. Well, this is it. We we know what our variable is. It's P, and our equation is Pivner. Just like that. So the only thing I guess you would say we're missing is a value of R. So we have moles, we have liters, we have Kelvin. So we get to choose really whatever R we want. It doesn't say give the pressure in atmospheres. But remember the most common value of R is 0 0.082 liter atmospheres per mole Kelvin. If I plug in that one, my pressure will come out in atmospheres, which is fine by me. <clears throat> so let's solve for P, it'll be NRT over V. So let's sub uh, 0.023 moles times 0 0.082 liter atmospheres moles Kelvin and 293 Kelvin. I'm putting in all the units on this problem so we can, I can show you how they work out. But moving forward, I'm probably going to start dropping them a little bit. Our volume is 4.2 liters. So let's see how the units work out. <clears throat> I've got this nasty unit for R in the top. So it's got a, a liter on top in the top. And here we have a liter on top in the bottom. Those actually cancel. So on the top of the top and on top of the bottom, those cancel. Let's make that look like it really cancels. All right. Moles on top and then a mole in bottom on the top. That cancels. Same thing with Kelvin. Kelvin on top, Kelvin on bottom in the top. So that leaves atmospheres on top of the top. And that's exactly what we want. So our answer would be 0.023 times 0.082 times 293 
divided by 4.2. So unless I've made a mistake here, it seems like a very low pressure, I get 0.13 atmospheres. That's very low. But that is not very many moles, that's not very many particles into a pretty large container, just over a liter, just over a gallon. So, and it's pretty cold. So, yeah, I guess it's okay. Oh, yeah, there's the answer at the bottom. It is good. All right, let's let's set a goal of working through five here, and we're going to quit no matter what time it is. Number five or eight thirty, whichever one comes first. All right, oxygen gas is collected at a pressure of one twenty three kilopascals. So there's my P. Here's my V, ten liters. What temperature? So there's my question on point five moles. There's my N in order to maintain this pressure. And then it wants the answer in Celsius, so we'll come back to that. So the first thing that we're gonna to have to do is we've got 123 kilopascals. So the R value we used last time, we can't plug kilopascals into. So there's a couple of ways we could handle it. We could look up a different R value. There is an R value with kilopascals, but for practice, what I think I'll do with you guys is we'll convert kilopascals into atmospheres. We, we did a few of these last week, and I, I feel like they're probably good practice. So let's get out of kilopascals and into atmospheres. So if you remember last week, I am pretty sure I recycled that paper. We're going to use the atmospheric values. So an atmospheric pressure in atmospheres is one. Kilopascals, I do believe I forgot to tell you, it's 101.3. So we talked about pascals as 101,000. There's 1.01 1 .01 times 10 to the fifth on that on our paper. And I did forget to mention that um, because the pascal is so small, most people use kilopascals because the, the numbers now look kind of normalish. So that's, that's where that comes from, just converting pascals into kilopascals. But that is normal. And what that would give us is 123 divided by 101.3. So that would be pressure is 1.21 atmospheres. And now we can use the same R we used in number one. All right, so PIV-NERT. And we're going to solve for T. So uh, T will equal PV over NR. T P PV over NR. All right, so let's plug in our 1.21 atmospheres. Our volume is 10. We have a half a mole. And we get to use the same R value. All right, so we sub that and simplify, we should be in good shape. All right, came out to be 295 Kelvin. Remember, temperature and all this is Kelvin, so our answers are being Kelvin. If it wants it in Celsius, we have to subtract 273. So our temperature will be, uh, I believe that's 22 degrees Celsius. Yep, master's at the bottom. All right, number three, how many moles of chlorine? All right, well, this time we're going to be solving for N. The volume is 35.5 liters. The pressure is 100 kilopascals. And the temperature is 100 degrees Celsius. 
Okay. All right. Well, in the last problem, we did a pressure conversion. Since it would be the exact same here, uh, let's do a different approach on this. And let me show you how I can actually change my R value. Technically, I'm doing another pressure conversion. You could always look up these R values on charts, but let's just say you don't have a chart. You can convert just by changing your atmosphere unit with a conversion into kilopascals. And it's the same conversion we used up here. One atmosphere is 101.3 kilopascals. And so our value of R in kilopascals would be 8.31 kilopascals liters over mole K. And we can plug that in now since we're dealing with kilopascals. All right, so there's our, uh, that was our P. Temperature's 100, so we're gonna make sure that we convert that to 373 Kelvin, add 273. And the problem says, after you get the moles, go ahead and calculate the number of grams. All right, so we'll have an additional step when this is over with. So PIV NERT is our equation. That's the ideal gas. This time we're looking for moles. So N will be PIV over ERT. And let's plug in. All right, so our pressure is in kilopascals this time, 100. Our volume is 35.5. Okay, that's liters. We're gonna use the R value we just converted, 8.31. Remember, this is the same R as before, it's just a different unit. Same amount, just a different way of looking at it. Like $1 is 100 cents. That's the same amount of money, just a different unit. And then the temperature here is 373. So we're gonna get, let's see, 100 times 35.5, one three one divided by three seven three one point one five moles of chlorine. And they say, go ahead and uh, go ahead and find us the number of grams. Okay, so we know how to do that. One point one five moles of chlorine. We're going to set up a conversion factor. And we'll convert moles to grams. One mole of diatomic chlorine. Chlorine has a molar mass of 71. We've done that a few times. And we get 81.7 grams. So a little bit different than the key at the bottom of the page because of the way I rounded it, I'm sure. But there we go. Number four, what is the volume of a balloon if it contains 3.2 moles of helium at a temperature of 20 Celsius, all right, so 293 Kelvin, so remember just to add 273. And standard pressure. Okay, well, that's a different piece of information. So we just got through talking about that. I'm sure you don't remember it, but normal pressure is atmospheric. Okay, we say one atmosphere only because that's the easiest number. It's atmospheric, 14.7 psi, 101.3 kilopascals, 760 torr, whatever. It's atmospheric. It is easier though if we say the pressure is one atmosphere because the number one is a pretty easy thing to work with. All right, so what is the volume of a balloon? Well, PIV NERT and volume is what we're looking for. So it'll be NRT over P. We got 3.2 moles this time. Since we're back to atmospheres, we can go back to the R value of 0.082 we can use our 293 Kelvin for our temperature all over that one atmosphere. And look how easy that denominator turned out to be. So 
times 0 0.082 times 293. So this is a very straightforward one here to two sig figs, 77 liters. One of the easier problems on the page. All right, last one for tonight. <clears throat> Calculate the volume which one mole of a gas occupies at STP. All right, so theoretically, you should know the answer to this based on some things that we did, some notes we took. So let's go through the math and see if it can remind you if you've forgotten. STP is standard temperature and pressure. I know you guys aren't going to say it out loud, but think to yourself, what is, what is standard temperature? Do you remember it? And what is standard pressure? Standard pressure, we just talked about one atmosphere. Standard temperature, zero Celsius, which is 273 Kelvin. All right, now we have P, we have T, we have N. What volume will that occupy? So PIV, NERT, looking for V again. So N, R, T over P. One mole, 0 0.082, since we're using atmospheres. My T is 273. And my P is also one. So very simple here. You're just essentially multiplying R times T. And we get 22.4 liters. And that's supposed to be the discovery. Hopefully you remember that number. We said that that is the volume of any, one mole of any gas at STP is 22.4 liters. All right, so I think for the homework, I'm going to also suggest working the back. So that'll end up being, I think, 10 problems. The answers are at the bottom, so you can check your work on these, but ideal gas law and those other problems are very important to work. So it's been a long night. It's seven minutes early. Hopefully that's not a huge deal. So Jeffrey, unless you have a question, we're gonna log off and, and enjoy our weekend.